This is the Millwright Carve King. It is a hobbyist level CNC router, and it's a machine that I've had for a couple years now. Having it has been really great. It has considerably opened up the, the range of materials that I can work with, that I can incorporate into my projects. But then again, getting comfortable with this machine has been quite the learning curve. The world of hobbyist 3D printing has been pretty refined. You pretty much just hit go and then it does the whole thing. But the world of, of hobby CNC is still in its infancy, and because of that, it's much less so. Where in 3D printing, the setup process is almost negligible, but the actual making of it can take many hours. CNC is kind of the opposite in that the setup can take quite a bit of time, but that the actual process might only be a minute or two. And because the world of CNC routing is so unrefined, people kind of have to figure things out as we go. So I'm making this video to give you a couple of tips and tricks to try and figure out your machine to make things easier for you, things that I had to figure out the hard way. So hopefully I can help streamline that learning process for you so you don't have to spend two years getting comfortable with your machine like I have. My first and probably most useful trick has to do with homing the machine, which is generally the most difficult step in the whole setup process. So once I've secured my material to my bed, I want to move the, the spindle around until it gets to a good position so I can start cutting it. Moving the X and Y axes around is generally pretty simple. You just jog them into the controller. The difficult part comes when you need to adjust the Z axis. So you'll jog it close and you'll get it in the general range and then you'll just have to kind of fiddle with it until it gets somewhere near where you want it to be. Often people will just stick a paper under there and they'll be satisfied once that paper is kind of stuck in between the material and the spindle bit. The reason we're stuck doing this is because we don't have what the professional level machines have, which is a probe. The probes will just touch down automatically and they will on their own figure out how high they need to be, no issue. But fortunately, without too much difficulty, we can kind of make our own probe. What you can do is just pull out your handy dandy multimeter here. And I'll turn it on and switch it to ohms, so we're measuring resistance here. You can see it says OL, that's overload, meaning that there is nothing connected, the resistance is too high. I'll go ahead and set it down here so you can see the reading. So I've got my two probes here. I'm going to use a couple of alligator clips to connect these. So I'm going to take one of the probes, put an alligator clip on it. It doesn't matter which one, you could use either for, for either purpose and it would have the same effect but I'm gonna take the ground one just because it makes more sense and I'm going to clip it to my piece. So my black probe is connected to my material, then I'll go ahead and connect the red probe to my bit. So now what I can do is I can simply jog the, the Z axis down in very small increments until this reading changes, until I get an actual resistance reading and at that point I will know that the two pieces are connecting. Usually I'll get it pretty close in one millimeter measurements, and then I'll set my controller to jog at 0.05 millimeters, and I'll go down from there. So I'll start moving down here in 20th millimeter increments. Oh, and right there. So at this point we see OL overload, and then I move down by 0.05 millimeters, and we get a resistance reading. What that means is that the two pieces have connected and our Z level is currently at the very top of our workpiece. If the material you're working with is not electrically conductive like aluminum here, that's also totally fine. You can just grab a piece of some conductive material, again, like aluminum, put it on top of your, let's say, wood or plastic or something like that, do the same trick, then measure the thickness of whatever material you put on there and jog down by that thickness. So it's the same sort of thing, just offset up and then you have to compensate for that. But with this method, we accomplish the same thing as a probe, except with tools and probably meters that you already have at your disposal. The next thing I'd like to talk about is dialing in your machine. The first cuts you make will likely be pretty accurate. Most likely your machine and your G-code center will work together pretty well and it'll know how long things should be. But it's also very unlikely that things will be perfect. Things may need a little bit of adjustment and fortunately, that's not too difficult to do. The G-code communication software that I use is called UGS, standing for Universal G-Code Sender. It's a pretty common one and it works very well. In the UGS software, you can go to the machine tab up top and then go to the setup wizard. You can skip through the first few steps and you get to a point 
called step calibration. Here you can specify how many steps per millimeter each axis needs. Again, it's likely pretty close, but maybe not exactly. All you have to do is jog the machine in that axis and then measure how far it actually goes. The difficult part there is just measuring it accurately. I'm gonna be using my digital calipers to do that precision measurement. I'll first just stick a screw then into one of the existing holes here. I'll open up my caliper so that the screw is inside of it like that. So then I'll just put the, the tip of the bit into here and I'll jog it over a known amount and it'll push this open and then I'll be able to measure the amount accurately on here. For a little extra security, I'm gonna put a little bit of double-sided tape under here to keep it better in place. So now we'll jog the bit over so it's inside that gap. Careful not to damage the, uh, the calipers. So now I'm inside it, I'll turn on my digital calipers. I'll now close the calipers so that it's up against the bit. And at this point, when it's in a good position, I'm going to zero it out. So I'll get a nice clean reading on that. So in the setup wizard, I'm going to jog the controller something like 100 millimeters. So I jogged it 100 millimeters and it says 99.94. You might not be able to read it. So when I plug in those numbers here, See, that's the negative 100 right there, 99.94. The calculated steps per millimeter does not change. So what this is telling me is that it is as precise as it can be. So I'm all good here. So now I can do the same thing with the Y axis. Doing the Z axis is a little easier because it doesn't really take any setup. You can just take normal depth measurements off of some flat area on the Z. Those two things were the big pieces of advice. So now I'll give you some smaller piece of advice, but rapid fire. Don't try to clamp your material directly to the bed. It's more difficult and you'll just end up damaging it. Instead, clamp a sacrificial piece of plywood to the bed and then you can screw your material directly down to it. It makes everything easier. If you can, save an old laptop or even an old desktop and use it exclusively for your CNC machine. It'll save a lot of hassle, especially if you're like me and the machine is out in a garage and you don't want to have to haul a computer back and forth repeatedly. The computer does not need to be good. It pretty much only just needs to turn on. Know that a standard hobbyist level CNC can cut aluminum, but not really anything too much harder. It's possible that you could cut something like sheet steel with the right setup and the right bit, but aluminum is generally the limit. Remember that you don't have to always go through the trouble of making G-code. Sometimes you can just use your CNC as if it were a normal mill. If all I'm doing is cutting a rectangle or a square out of my material, making G-code would take a long time. So instead I can just turn on my spindle, set the proper feed rate, and then simply jog the, the machine to do the cutting for me. No G-code required. It can be difficult to determine what a proper feed rate and cut depth can be for a hobbyist level machine. Most calculators you'll find are geared towards true robust machines, not like what we have. So my advice there is instead of trying to calculate or find it on the internet, just do it experimentally. It is not difficult to set up your material, turn on your spindle, move it to a conservative depth of cut, and set it to a conservative feed rate and just see if it works. If it does, you can bump it up a little bit until you're uncomfortable. I have found that when working with new materials, it is easiest just to experimentally determine feed rates, and that way I'm truly confident I'm not going to break anything when I hit the play button. Oftentimes you want to leave tabs to keep your piece in place while you're cutting it. The easiest way I've found to cut these tabs is just to use a chisel. Even when using materials that are hard like aluminum, one tap from the chisel is usually enough to break through those tabs quickly and cleanly. Get a deburring tool. Hobby machines like this tend to leave a lot of burrs and one of these guys, though simple it is, is extremely effective. Just one quick swipe and they'll knock off all the burrs giving you a very clean finish making cleanup very simple. And the last piece of advice, the last tip I have to give is don't be afraid to break the machine. I certainly was when I started, but I quickly learned that if anything is gonna break on here, it's gonna be the bit. And those are meant to be replaceable anyways. They are expendable. If that is all that breaks, then you're totally fine. So it's okay to push it a little bit hard. It's okay to find its limits because nothing bad is ever really gonna happen. So that's all I have to say about it. Hopefully there was a tip and or trick in there that'll help you out in the future, that'll help bring you closer to really being comfortable with your hobbyist level CNC router. It only takes a few simple changes to what you're currently doing to make things a little bit safer and a whole lot quicker. I will leave links to some of the tools I used here in the description, along with a link to this machine itself. That's all I have for now, so bye.